Hi everyone, welcome to History Respawn. I'm your host Bob Whitaker, and on today's episode I'm going to be streaming some of the new Discovery Tour mode from Ubisoft called Viking Age, uh, which is built around uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Uh, so I got a review copy of Viking Age last week from Ubisoft, and uh, I managed to play through the whole game uh, this past week, and I uh, thought I would just kind of go through some of the things that I liked and uh, didn't like about this new version of Discovery Tour. And I would say just off the top that I think this new version of Discovery Tour makes some big improvements uh, over what have come before in Assassin's Creed Origins and uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump in here to a game uh, that I've already got going. Um, and uh, again, this is the uh, pre-release version of this game, uh, 1.0. I don't know how much this will change uh, with the day one release or the day one patch, but uh, regardless, uh, here we are uh, with this uh, new Discovery Tour game. And uh, so I'll just jump in here. And uh, I am playing this, uh, as you can tell off the resolution, I'm playing this on a widescreen monitor. I'm uh, playing it on a i7 processor with uh, a 3070 uh, graphics card. Uh, and uh, so the game looks pretty good. It's on ultra high settings. Uh, my computer is laboring just a little bit. You might be able to hear it through the mic, <laughs> but not too terribly. Uh, and so this is the uh, free roam uh, that's available, I think, from the very beginning of Discovery Tour. but. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the Discovery Tour uh, characters, Elric, who is a monk. Uh, and uh, this is uh, just kind of me roaming around after I've completed the main quest uh, in Discovery Tour. And you know what separates this version of Discovery Tour from the previous versions from Origins and Odyssey uh, is the fact that it's built around characters and it includes a storyline, it includes quests. Uh, so I think uh, when I've done previous episodes on Discovery Tour, that was kind of the big criticism I had was the fact that uh, there isn't enough game in this history game. Uh, you know, it's kind of a really good museum piece, a really good example of, um, you know, kind of a museum tour built into an Assassin's Creed world. Uh, but I think, you know, the developers really hadn't made use of the gameplay elements that are available in Assassin's Creed. And so uh, this game dives into that. It really tries to build a story out of uh, what had previously just been a guided museum-like tour. So to give you a sense of that, uh, let me jump in here. And um, as with previous Discovery Tour modes, you've got the full map here, full game map. Uh, it includes uh, England and it also includes Norway as well. And uh, it also has uh, these quest lines. And so you can see over here just to the right, uh, it has got a series of quests that you go on. And I think there's eight stories here and they're all interconnected. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick one of these early ones here. I don't want to... Uh, kind of ruin the storyline for anybody who wants to follow through it. But this is one of the early ones uh, following or like a, a uh, Anglo-Saxon monk uh, living in Britain during the ninth century. Uh, so this, uh, this quest line will give you a sense of how the game plays and uh, what it's like, this new Discovery Tour experience. So let's jump into this. Um, and because this includes... Uh, the entire game world, uh, this version of Discovery Tour, it takes up, I think, about the same amount of space as uh, the base game uh, for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So in other words, uh, you're talking, you know, close to 100 gigs. Uh, so it's, it's quite a meaty uh, add-on uh, for this game. So 
So again, this sets us in the 9th century, 870 CE. Brother Elrich, awaken. And um, just off the top, I'm not a content expert. Uh, I have a PhD in British history, <laughs> but it's modern British history. So I know a little bit about this time period, but uh, not nearly as much as uh, many others uh, experts, quote unquote experts you can find on the internet. Uh, but we will be doing uh, some sort of Discovery Tour uh, Viking Age episode with a content expert uh, sometime within the next month. Uh, but yeah, so this is uh, the kind of setting that you find yourself in when you start playing uh, as Elrich. And you are going around uh, now, in your new prime. monastery um, doing just daily activities. And as you'll notice, as we go along the way, and we're supposed to follow this character, not unlike a, a follow quest in an Assassin's Creed game, uh, you come across these markers. And these markers are the stand-ins for kind of the older version of Discovery Tour, right? Built around uh, these, uh, what I used to call museum plaques. I don't know what the development team calls them. But uh, here you've got one for the monastery that Elrich finds himself in. And then you can click into this and get some uh, extra information. And uh, this is kind of what you would expect uh, from previous versions of Discovery Tour. Uh, but now it's built around this uh, character-driven story, uh, which I think is a really effective technique to drive the player forward uh, into this historical content. And uh, in addition to this kind of traditional description, of the monastery, uh, kind of similar in terms of size and length to what we had in previous Discovery Tours. Uh, we also now have uh, credits to go along with it. And for some of the historical texts that are written as well, uh, you get credits to the scholarly authors uh, along with the information about what library or museum or uh, university they work for. So that's great. And so, you know, you're going along and you can kind of see these markers if you follow the HUD up at the top. Uh, you see uh, markers set around, you can see the distance to them. And what's great is that even though you've got this narrative story going on, uh, you know, while you're walking around, you are absolutely welcome to just run off and dive into one of these markers. You don't necessarily have to automatically follow the storyline. You can just kind of break the narrative at any point and then return to it uh, no problem. And so you can see another one of these markers here. Jump into this. And this is an interesting one. Uh, I don't think I've done this one, so let's take a look at this one. Photogrammetry isn't just a very hard word to say. It's also an innovative technique for in-game textures. Determined to illustrate accurate surfaces, the graphics team traveled to England to capture every inch of stone walls and pavements, sometimes for 12 hours straight. A three-meter wall would take 250 pictures, stitched together by specialized software. The final result is a 3D file with colors and depths, designed into tileable textures. These textures are then used by level artists and modelers to add onto buildings. To push the realism further, the graphics team also added uneven silhouettes with protruding stones, slate <laughs> angles, and damaged areas. So these uh, parts of the tour, uh, these are the behind the scenes markers, and these are notes regarding uh, how the team, the development team, uh, used historical material uh, and adapted historical material for the game and then also for Discovery Tour mode. So these are kind of behind the scenes tours related to game development and art design uh, and level creation. Uh, and these uh, tours, these behind the scenes one, these blue markers on the HUD, uh, they, come along, uh, they uh, include uh, the um, uh, the voice of Sean, uh, the assassin historian character uh, that you come across uh, in the games. Uh, and so 
these parts of Discovery Tour, these are very well produced. Uh, these are also include voice acting. Uh, and uh, they also tend to be uh, a fair bit longer uh, than some of the more historically focused uh, tour markers that you find in this game. Uh, and so I think it's great on the one hand to have this kind of uh, game development focused version of uh, the tour, uh, but at the same time it also, <laughs> just in the amount that these behind the scenes markers are produced, and the amount in which they include voice acting, they feel a little navel gazy. Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, you can tell that the development team was really into telling this side of the story and maybe a little bit less interested in the kind of historically driven aspects of this game. Uh, so, just kind of a little bit brief aside there. All right, well, let's keep falling over chair and see what he has to do as part of his daily routine now that he's joined this monastery. Let's see, you've got more markers in here, uh, but we'll just carry forward. And uh, have him do his daily prayer. So, in previous versions of Discovery Tour, I had uh, been a bit upset because here we found ourselves in the game world of these Assassin's Creed games, and it was very often the case that in Discovery Tour, uh, whether it was for Origins or whether it was for Odyssey, that you couldn't interact with the game world in the same way that you could uh, in the game itself. And so I felt like the developers were really missing an opportunity to take advantage of the interactive nature of Assassin's Creed. But in this game, uh, you actually have the opportunity, as you can see here, to participate in some of these events and some of the activities within the game world. Uh, and so this is a good example here of participating uh, in liturgy. And so this might seem incredibly dull <laughs> to just about everybody else but me, but I think this is a really good application of this type of program, you know, this type of attempt of changing Discovery Tour, making it more interactive and uh, I can't help but think, but these kinds of elements will really help to drive uh, players to get interested in uh, the history that's included in this mode. So I'll just quickly scroll through these, can you use some more information regarding monastic life. So we'll break out of that. Um, and then again, you see, you walk through here, and you've got some of these uh, historical markers, but you kind of have a reason, I think, as a player to linger in these areas because of some of the interactive elements. So let's walk up to these and see what we have. All right, so this is an important one related to relics and to saints. Uh, this plays a big role in uh, the storyline uh, that we've got here. And of course, you've got the image credits here, so you can see where this is located, Winchester uh, Museum. Uh, you even got the... Uh, official cultural trust reference number. I suppose maybe you can go and look this up in the archive somewhere. That's, that's a nice slot as a historian. Uh, but again, you know, uh, yeah, pretty good description here of the importance of relics and saints. Um, you know, not only overly burdensome, just kind of here if you want to read it. Uh, but I think, you know, when you compare this to, say, the behind-the-scenes markers, this is a lot less compelling, I think, 
uh, because it doesn't come with narration. Uh, it doesn't come uh, with kind of the fancier production uh, in the length of the behind the scenes markers. So I just think that's kind of a, uh, there's a point of criticism I have about this version of Discovery Tour, which I think is really great. Uh, it's that I wish that all of the tour markers were as produced uh, as uh, the blue behind the scenes markers. And I'll see if I can find another one of those behind the scenes markers. There's one up here. I just want to just kind of run off, forget my monastery duties here. Or my monastic duties, I guess I should say, and run over to one of these other behind the scenes markers and see what it tells us. see what this one is. Ooh. Background on Leap of Faith. As the monastery of Ely had been destroyed, level designers and artists had to draw their inspiration elsewhere. More specifically, from the Saint-Martin du Canigou Abbey in France. Despite the construction being two centuries older than AC Valhalla's time period, <laughs> it offered interesting architecture for the players to enjoy atop the hill for great scenery, a cloister to clear the perspective, and the bell tower to provide an iconic viewpoint. Finally, an underground tunnel was added, a unique feat perfect for a surprise attack. But some things remain accurate. Several eels were placed in the waters circling the monastery, a nod to the feature that gave it its name. Hmm. Uh, so... This is a good example of the type of content you'll find in one of these behind the scenes tours. Uh, what's great about these, uh, in addition to the production values and the voiceover, uh, is the fact that it does make notes as to where the development team took license uh, with the, his, the history in order to make uh, the environments, the gameplay more compelling. Um, and that's, you know, it kind of noted here with the fact that the, the original monastery had been destroyed, but they've created a new one based off of one in France, right? So, uh, again, uh, you know, some, uh, I, I would say, more pedantic historians might have a problem with this kind of thing, but I kind of see it as uh, largely a necessary evil uh, in order to make for an interesting environment for the player uh, to go through. And... Uh, this monastery here is uh, also lo also located in the base game, uh, and you can see that too with a lot of the other uh, environments uh, within uh, Discovery Tour. You know, it's just taken whole cloth uh, from Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and so there's all sorts of these blue markers around that kind of give you some background as to why the team made the decisions that it did in order to kind of mix uh, history, but also include kind of interesting gameplay developments. So let's get back here. And it looks like I've done all of the behind the scenes tours. And as you complete these tours, you get the opportunity to uh, change your character, play your character uh, through these. And actually, let me take a moment, just show you the pause menu here. So we've got the map. Uh, as you expect, you can, of course, travel uh, to any of these viewpoint locations, uh, you know, and kind of tour around uh, any of those localities, just like you would in the base version of Valhalla. Uh, you've got the quests listed out here, and, you know, it's pretty quickly uh, able to load you into those quests, or at least it is on uh, this computer. Uh, and then you've got the codex, and this divides uh, the regular tours, the regular markers, historical markers uh, that you've discovered with the behind the scenes markers. So at any point, uh, you know, for any of the previous tours that you looked at, you can come back here to the pause menu and go through them. So we can, you know, for instance, go to uh, Battle of Eddington. And we've got here one of these historical markers that I discovered in the game. Uh, and so now it's here. Uh, list down and I can go back and view it. Uh, but again, with these regular historical markers, no voiceover, and usually not nearly this long 
of a description. Here we'll go to uh, uh, curing fish and see this is kind of this is a bit what uh, most of the markers, historical markers I found were like, you know, just kind of one short paragraph describing some sort of historical element and not a great deal of uh, nuance or detail uh, placed in those. Uh, but then you get over here to the behind the scenes and uh, we have got a fewer number of these entries, but at the same time, uh, you know, more information. So let's listen to this uh, one related to assassin's weapons. 200 unique weapon models were designed for AC Valhalla. After thorough historical research, modeling artists had the difficult task of designing realistic but spectacular weapons. Talk about a brain twister. Well, that's a good name for a weapon. The flail was also added to the arsenal as a unique form of weaponry. Even though flails weren't used by soldiers in battle, but by peasants during harvest. To enjoy these weapons even more, new fighting styles were created. Players can now fight with a weapon in each hand, the dual wielding, or hit foes with their shield. Sort of like a dual shielding. <laughs> uh, so Sean, uh, you know, as... Uh, the in-game character, the voice actor, too, very consistent with their line delivery <laughs> throughout the entire Assassin's Creed series. I'm sure if you're a fan of Assassin's Creed, you've heard his uh, his voice. Uh, you've met his character uh, over the past decade and more, decade plus, uh, and uh, I just think his characterization is really great. It kind of uh, uh, snide, uh, <laughs> snobbish <laughs> British historian. Um, yeah, so this is the pause menu, and then, uh, of course, as you go along, and as you are uh, exploring the environment, as you're collecting uh, these uh, codex entries, uh, you also unlock new characters that you can play as uh, in Discovery Tour. Uh, so you can see a bunch of them that I've come across, and then some of the ones that are still um, not available, you can unlock by you know visiting 80 Discovery sites. Uh, so... Uh, I'm going to leave myself as uh, Brother Ehrlich, but uh, yeah, so you've got you know, basically every character, every major character uh, in the game uh, listed here. So let's, uh, let's keep going. Let's go to a, a new section of Ehrlich's story here. And um, the perhaps uh, for the sake of mobility... Uh, this monk <laughs> is the same maneuverability, the same uh, parkour skills as an assassin. But, uh, you know, what else do you expect uh, from an Assassin's Creed game? Time to eat. And there she was an abbess. And then you used to wear woolen garments. So I think some players might find this kind of stuff a little bit silly, um, you know, kind of uh, missing the action and the violence and the excitement of the regular game, but I really kind of appreciate the fact that the developers have taken this, you know, huge expensive AAA game and game engine and used it to give us uh, different perspectives on this historical time period. And so here we've got a minor emergency in which one of our fellow monks has gotten ill at uh, the breakfast table. And now we've got to rush him over to the infirmary. And so again, it's kind of... Uh, you wouldn't necessarily call this an everyday moment, but it is like low in terms of historical importance. But... Uh, I think these kind of events, they they play a role in helping the player empathize with these historical figures, with these, you know, largely nameless NPCs. And also, you know, placing them in these kind of position gives them, I, I would say, a more authentic idea of what living in these past ages was really like, right? Uh, you know, it wasn't all just running around off rooftops and stabbing people. <laughs> So here we're going to talk to 
The patient speaks of fire an expert on an uncommon ailment. Medicine. And what I don't know by heart. The scribes often copy remedies in the scriptorium. You may be able to find something there to aid you. But if not, Sister Winifred will be able to help. Yes, Father. Scriptorium. Right, I remember where that was. So we've got to rush off and uh, try to find a cure for this guy. Okay, we'll jump in here. Can I help you, brother? And uh, we're trying to track down some specific reference to his particular ailment. So it talks yellow disease. I don't think that's it. Check over here in this back corner. And it does kind of hold your hand here with these quest markers. Um, you know, I know it's been very popular with some... Uh, no. Uh, younger Assassin's Creed players to, to get rid of those quest markers, but me as an old person, I just just point me in the right direction. Elf Hickey. Oh, interesting. No. No. Let's come jog over here and see if there's something useful. Vivid pain of the side. Frequent cough, dryness of tongue. Vicious fever. That sounds right. Hmm. Ask Sister Winifred. Maybe not. Okay. What do I know? I'm just a doctor of history, not Sister an Winifred. actual physician. <laughs> I can't find a remedy. Tell me, what is the cure for fire in the veins? A dire challenge indeed. Ox's recipe for pain should aid us here. You will need double brood ale, honey, fever few, and wormwood. Though with the raids nearby of late and the early first frost, you may have trouble with the latter. Is there anything that can replace it? Well, I have heard that dust from a relic can have miraculous properties. We're blessed here in Ellie to have several. Perhaps, if you gather some, the saints will intercede on your patient's behalf. Thank you, sister. God bless you. Double brewed ale, honey, fever few, and the dust of a relic. Should be simple enough. So here we've got a recipe to try to help our fellow uh, monk uh, with his illness, and... You know, it gives us uh, a reason to continue this story, uh, but it also drags us into new areas that include uh, these new markers, uh, historical markers. Uh, and so we've learned here a little bit more about uh, medieval ideas about health and wellness and the, the four humors. And so, uh, you know, from my perspective, I find this technique of driving players into these situations that brings them to these tour markers, I find this way more compelling than previous versions of Discovery Tour in which you were basically following uh, kind of individual museum exhibits, you know, connected uh, markers that you would follow with a voiceover included. Um, and I do miss the voiceover for these uh, discovery markers, whatever you want to call them. Let's, let's look at the exact term again, because I'm kind of embarrassed. Learnings. Um, these learnings. Uh, I do miss kind of the production value of these learnings, you know, compared especially to the behind the scenes markers. But at the same time, you know, I feel like the story and the narrative in this version of Discovery Tour it propels the player to kind of find these markers or at least to come into contact with them in a way that I don't think really existed uh, for many players in previous versions of Discovery Tour. Uh, maybe I'm wrong there. I don't know if you know Ubisoft has got exact data on that. Uh, but it just seems like uh, you know there wasn't quite of enough of an emphasis uh, you know trying to encourage the player to explore the game world. Uh, in Discovery Tour. So I think it's a really good improvement. I like this technique. Um, and, you know, it. I think what I like the most about it is it leans into the game. Um, you know, I think one of the mistakes that previous versions of Discovery Tour made was it kind of took the game out of Assassin's Creed. 
and you know as any player of Assassin's Creed can tell you it's a really compelling game and so you know if you're trying to introduce the history to players there's no better way to do that I than to kitchens. have them play right and so this version uh, this type of discovery tour with the storyline with this interactivity I just think makes a lot more sense right because it, it puts the game back in this uh, edutainment product right? so I don't think I'll, I'll keep going this um, not to spoil anything too much, but you do end up fighting uh, the entire recipe, and it does help out your fellow monk. But I'm going to jump over to one of these other quests, and uh, what's interesting with these quests is we've got um, basically four different player characters. You've got, or like the monk, uh, you've got uh, a merchant couple from Norway, uh, uh, Thornstein and Gunhilda, uh, and then finally... Uh, you have a brief interlude here near the end uh, with King Alfred. And I really like the fact that there are different player characters in Discovery Tour, uh, largely because it gives you kind of different perspectives on this time period. With Ehrlich, you've got, uh, you know, quest lines and um, discovery markers related to uh, health and medicine, related to religion, um, in kind of everyday life from an Anglo-Saxon perspective. Uh, with the merchant couple from Norway, the Vikings, you get a perspective on what's driving uh, Scandinavians to uh, expand and raid during this time period. You're also getting a sense of kind of everyday life uh, for what you might call the middling sort during this time period, not necessarily middle class, but middle sort. Uh, and then also with King Alfred, you get a good sense from his quest line, uh, you know, kind of regarding the politics, the high politics of this time period, and not just the politics of, uh, you know, related to ninth uh, century England, but then also kind of related more broadly to the medieval world, uh, particularly in that way, the relationship between um, uh, secular leaders and religious leaders. Uh, so I think those varying perspectives are really interesting. I'm just going to briefly jump in uh, to one of those tours. And yes, I'm going to do this one called Seaworthy. And so here we are with Thorstein. He's our uh, merchantman. Uh, living in Norway, and he's attempting to uh, find his way out of Norway and get to England. So off-screen, Thornstein has spent the past uh, five years uh, working... Uh, to raid England uh, and in that time he's accrued quite a bit of wealth and he wants to now use that wealth to go back to England and settle basically so I pried the book from his hands and tore the covers off to bring home I'll be able to afford another slave this harvest season at the very least and these Saxons and their books you think they were more precious than their own lives, but if no one lives to speak of what's written down, who will remember it? <laughs> Not to speak of how they treat their dead, putting bones or pieces of wood inside golden boxes. <laughs> how this honors their god, I'll never understand. But waiting won't make it any easier. Um, so just like with uh, Erlix. Uh, quest line. We've also got these markers that pop up here, and you, so you can learn more about uh, the game world, uh, the historical time period from uh, uh, Thornstein's position as a Viking. Uh, and we've got a, a brief description here of the Great Hall, uh, and then uh, you could see similar markers outside using the HUD. Uh, but I'll. Uh, 
kind of run up here. Let's see a little bit more of this storyline. Without experiencing the sting of your wit. Uh, the mood I'm in, you'd best hope for a stinging rather than a lashing. <laughs> <laughs> so this gives the, the Isle of Ely, Great Discovery one. Tour players the opportunity. A victory some of us wish were undone. Oh, intriguing. And <laughs> gives an opportunity of... Uh, I've heard of your gives the your uh, Discovery Tour player the opportunity to play some of these uh, gameplay modes uh, that are familiar uh, to players of the base game. You said it yourself. I've no need to impress. <laughs> the merchant with the silver tongue strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame Harald Jarl outshines you so brightly. He outshines us both. He's so sprightly. Sprightly. Let's hope that we goes over. Oh. Oh no. I, I like Sprightly. Come on. Alright, let's go visit Harold. Another marker here. And again, you can hear Harold yelling, yelling at me, uh, but you can interrupt any of those moments and jump into one of these uh, uh, tour elements, uh, which I think is great. I mean, that's exactly what you want, because you know, it could be the case um, that these moments could be scripted, right? And so you're just kind of stuck in an animation or you're stuck following a particular quest line, and if you move out of bounds, then, you know, you could lose the quest and you'd have to start over. That doesn't happen at all with these Discovery Tour quests, and I think that's a really good move on the part of the developers. There's something I must say, my own. <laughs> so formal. Did the crossing scour our friendship from your mind? It did not. It's only by friendship that I am brave enough to speak. Now tell me then. I'm listening. I tire of raiding Harold. I want to settle where there's rich, dark soil for the taking. I want to make a place of our own where I can live out my days with my wife. You're young yet, my friend. Plenty of time to grow old with a bouncing So see, with these player characters name. in no, Discovery no. Tour, I've you know, Thorstein's long interest long. is not in today, uh, murder or pillage. Uh, it's not in king-making like you see perhaps. in the uh, base game for Valhalla, but instead it's wait. kind of everyday concerns about that building a life, uh, and in particular from the perspective no of... Uh, somebody living in wing. Norway during my this time period is an interest in uh, building a life for his family that involves land ownership. You know, really key point to uh, basically anywhere uh, in Europe <laughs> during this time, anywhere in the world, but especially in Europe and especially in Norway uh, during this time period. So I just, I love that fact. I love the idea that the... Um, uh, the developers have given these uh, tour uh, quests that perspective. You know, it's not about uh, the elements that you find in the game, uh, but instead it's about uh, kind of everyday interests, uh, everyday stories, uh, you know, maybe not historically accurate, but definitely historically authentic. And I think that is kind of the best part of this new version of Discovery Tour. Um, now, with all that said, you know, you know, are there some things that I hope they improve? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've said it many times already. I really wish these codex entries uh, included voice acting and production, uh, lengthy entries for all of these, as well as behind the scenes. I mean, I know a lot of work goes into this, but as a historian, that's the kind of thing that I would love to see. Um, and the other thing is, I think, you know, it's obvious that they want to include this uh, in a package for academics and particularly for 
grade school academics to introduce this time period to uh, players, uh, to you know, uh, students in particular. And I think in that context, you know, depending on the knowledge base of uh, the teacher or the professor, whatever the case may be, you know, maybe it doesn't matter so much that these uh, entries aren't that long or detailed because, you know, if you're thinking about it in the context of the classroom, then the teacher or the professor could be filling in a lot of those details or students could be getting them from other sources in the class. Um, but at the same time, for classroom use, and I'm just kind of speaking from my own perspective here, it is kind of still a very tough sell uh, to include this type of game in an actual classroom in terms of logistics, right? This is something that, you know, I think the standalone version of this will end up costing $20, which is not a huge barrier. But what is a barrier is the technological requirements. Um, you know, you've got to have a computer that can run this. And, you know, as somebody who's taught in high school classrooms, secondary classrooms uh, throughout the state of Texas, and then also in college classrooms and university classrooms uh, in Texas, Louisiana, I can tell you that most classroom computers are not even close to playing something like this. Now, there will be specialty um, specialty computer labs on university campuses in particular that could do this, but everyday classrooms, particularly at the secondary level, no way, not going to do it. Um, sure, you could bring in a game console and plug it into a display port on a projector, but that's that's kind of a lot of work, right? That's uh, a lot more work than what you would see with... Um, you know, kind of uh, the material, online material that's already available to academics. Now, of course, it doesn't look nearly as nice or as well produced as this, but it does contain quite a bit more historical knowledge than these types of things. So it's kind of like, I suppose it depends on the perspective of the teacher or professor. You know, what are they hoping the students get out of this? And then in addition to the heavy technology requirements, there's also... A really big problem I think in terms of space right you know this version of discovery tour that I've got loaded in here uh, this is the pre-release version and it is 90 gigs of space on my hard drive which you know on this PC my office PC not a huge deal right not a, not a big problem but for classroom computer <laughs> 90 gigs is 90 gigs too many right uh, most classroom computers might have uh, 250 gigs of space and the vast majority of that is taken up with uh, LMS software. It's taken up with uh, software required by the schools. Uh, it's taken up by you know Microsoft Office Suite. So all the things that you have on a typical classroom computer. And so I just really wonder you know, I, I love Discovery Tour. I love what they're trying to do. You know, I can see the advantages of exposing players to this kind of experience, especially in a non-violent capacity and with, you know, uh, expert scholarly material and archival material and archaeological material. That's all fantastic. But as far as actually seeing this used in the classroom, I feel like it's, it's an experience that can really only be enjoyed in the university classrooms at very wealthy schools. Um, I just don't see this really working um, in the type of classrooms that I've been in at the high school level uh, or at the community college level or even at uh, smaller research universities. Uh, just, that's a tough sell. Maybe things will be different, you know, um, you know, depending on the kind of desires of the professor or teacher, they could make it work. But I'm just thinking about this in terms of kind of broad-based adoption. I don't know, that's tough. Um, but, you know, maybe the developers know something I don't. Maybe they've got some kind of uh, uh, tracks to get this into the classroom and to get it used. And you know, of course, another thing with all of this, and this is 
related to the base game of Assassin's Creed as well as um, Discovery Tour is that a lot of this stuff can appear online in YouTube videos. And so, you know, even if you don't have the technology to run these things, you could definitely uh, show clips of Discovery Tour or the base version of Assassin's Creed uh, in the classroom, no problem. Uh, but I really feel like the heart of this Viking Age content is its interactivity, right? Is the ability to participate and to explore on your own uh, this historical era. And I feel like in order to, need to do that, you really need to have uh, a machine console or a PC that can run it. And you need to have kind of memory space to do that. And I just, I don't know if you're gonna get that in the classroom. Outside of the classroom for sure, but in the classroom, that's a really tough sell. So I think that does it. You know, I've been going for about 50 minutes. That's more than enough time. Um, yeah, so again, I'm really encouraged by what I've seen. I love Discovery Tour. I really appreciate that they've done this work. Um, and yeah, I'm just kind of curious to see, you know, what kind of classroom adoption there is uh, for this type of game. You know, I, I didn't really get a good sense of that with either of the previous versions of Discovery Tour. Uh, so I wonder, you know, will that, will that happen with this game? You know, is it, is it doing the kind of business that Ubisoft needs in order to make more of these? I, I don't know, but I hope they continue to make these because <laughs> I love talking about them and it, it's really kind of incredible uh, when you think about the work that goes into this that it exists to begin with and that not only that we've had one of these but we've got three of these so far three of these discovery tours i think that's remarkable and i i hope they keep doing it i hope it works for them um and i hope it works for students and teachers uh who you know have the wherewithal uh to actually do this um one last thing that i wanted to do actually just briefly so you can see here that the uh the eagle for Thorstein is um, uh, is uh, a raven, and I just want to quickly I want to see if this works. I'm going to change into Erlik here. Oh, I guess I can't do it. I guess I do. I have to get out of the quest. I probably do. Let's go to the Atlas here. Let's go to England. Yes. Oh yeah, okay. So we'll be able to see it. Um, so just like in uh, the base game, your player character has got access to Odin site, uh, which is kind of the old assassin's vision, and they also have access to a uh, uh, a winged animal <laughs> that allows them uh, to see and do reconnaissance further afield. And so we saw. In the base game, uh, you know, that's a raven. With Thorstein, it's a raven. And with Erlik the monk, uh, oh, I think in the quest it's different. But in the quest, his animal was a pigeon, which I just thought was adorable. Uh, I don't know if it it's different here because we're in open world. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was a pigeon, which I thought was just awesome. Uh, but, anyways, that's not here. But, uh, yeah. I think that does it. Uh, so thanks for joining me for this episode of History Respawned. Um, again, we'll do another episode uh, sometime this month, maybe next month, uh, with an expert scholar on uh, 9th century England um, to talk a little bit more about in detail about the uh, historical material that's in this Discovery Tour mode. But, you know, as far as this historian is concerned, I'm really impressed by what they've done here uh, i think if they got the opportunity to do a new discovery tour i'd like to see a few changes but i like the direction where this is going so far so uh, thanks again for joining me uh and until next time goodbye <laughs>